Well, good morning again. It is the rapture of the church. We are uh, going to start the rapture of the church. We may be here three weeks. We may be here four. I'm not real sure, to be honest. Uh, it depends on how much we can get through. So, but first and foremost, Yom Kippur starts this Tuesday at 1036 local. And we talked a little bit about Yom Kippur. And uh, we will talk about uh, Sukkot, which is the Feast of Booths, the Feast of the Festival, the Feast of Tabernacles. We'll talk a little bit about that next week. Uh, but this, anybody remember what these, the, the 10 days were called between... Uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Anybody what, remember what those days are called? David, stop. I know, I know you know. I've got to see if anybody else is paying attention. They are called the days of awe. Awe. Like awe. Oh, wow. Okay. And these are the days that you're supposed to, to take reflection. Now, Tishri 10 is Yom Kippur. It's the Day of Atonement. In the Jewish calendar, there was no day holier. And there still is no day holier. Uh, you will observe. Good morning. Come on in, guys. You will observe Jewish people acting fools all year long. But on the Day of Atonement, even the craziest of them goes to synagogue. All right? Um, be nice. You be nice. So. <laughs> So even on this, even even people, and basically we can think of it like this. Let's. Uh, many of you may have come from being Catholic, and you know family members that are Catholic, and they may be wild and crazy all year long, but on Easter or on Ash Wednesday, they're there. Think of this in the same way. All right, this is a, a high holy day. And the first Yom Kippur, of course, took place uh, after the Israelites' exodus from Egypt. And it marked the arrival of Mount si at Mount Sinai. And there are a lot there. I thought about listing all the things that have happened on Yom Kippur. It's impossible. Uh, there's a couple of dates that are really big. One of them is the 9th of Av. If a bad thing is going to happen to Israel, it's going to happen on the 9th of Av. But also the Day of Atonement. That's a big deal. Now, here's interesting. This is interesting. Anybody remember what starts Rosh Hashanah? First of all, it was the hidden, remember it was the hidden holiday, right? Okay, go ahead. The moon. The moon. Very good. Wow, I'm so glad Sam pays attention. Now, don't say like you do it. Okay, the moon. You had to see the moon. Well, guess what happened in Israel last week? Yep. It's a dust cloud. Say it, David. <laughs> Preach it, David. There was a dust cloud that blocked the moon, so they couldn't. They start. could not see the moon. Mm -hmm. It was the worst dust storm in the history of the country. Wow. For two days, the Orthodox rabbis could not see the moon. <clears throat> I think there's some prophetic significance in that, yep. given what all people have been pointing to for September 2015. And all of the things, the seventh, the beginning of the seventieth jubilee, uh, and the, the the second jubilee since the nation was established, uh, the Balfour Resolution in 1917, and the capturing of Jerusalem in the jubilee year in 1967, and now God delays the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets, and thus delays everything else. Now, most Jews will not count that; they will say because we know the moon, even though we couldn't see it, but the Orthodox do. They didn't see it until Tuesday. Just a side note. That's interesting. So, rapture of the church. What is it? Somebody give me a Reader's Digest one or two sentence summary of what the rapture of the church is. I've heard it years ago called the harvest, which is kind of interesting. Okay. Right in the harvest season. of the first fruits. Yeah, you're right in that season. Right. Okay. That's a very brief, that's good. What happens? What happens at the rapture of the church? 
There's two. There's there's two of yes, dear. The teacher's pet no. today. The dead in Christ rise first. The dead in Christ rise first, and then we who remain are caught up, and we're caught up in these bodies. No. No. What happens? We're glorified. We put on this mortal must put on immortality. Now there's two main scriptures that we get this doctrine of the rapture of the church from. But as we get into the rapture of the church concept, as we get deeper, you're going to see that it is there's much more out there. It's just hidden. And there's a reason for that. Yes, sir. I've always heard that That's, you know, one of the theories is is that uh, when we are raptured, you know what? Let's save that, Herman. Let's save that for the next uh, two weeks from now. Okay? Because that, yeah, let's save that for two weeks from now. Uh, so there are our two scriptures, 1 Thessalonians 15 through 18 and 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 55. If I could get a volunteer to take a place on 1 Thessalonians 4 and we'll come back to it. And then if I can get another volunteer to take place at 1 Corinthians 15 verses 50 through 55. Who, who will do 15 through 18 in 1 Thessalonians? Okay, Liz. Uh, Sandy, do you want to do 1 Corinthians? 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 55. Y'all just hang on there. We'll be back in a little bit. So, the rapture of the church. Believe it or not, there are some criticisms. There are criticisms, and I have fought these battles, uh, mostly among uh, those who are Catholic and uh, Protestant offshoots. We got to kind of remember, as we as Baptists aren't necessarily Protestant because we are not from those immediate branches that came off that were protesting the Catholic Church with their, you know, your Lutherans. Uh, your Calvinists uh, and, and various others. Uh, even though uh, the Roman Catholic Church will lump us into being Protestants, we're not. We are, what are we known as? Besides, we're Christians. But what's the label that we get labeled? We're not Baptists. We are. You are on a roll today. You're going to have to put you up here at the front of the class. Yeah. Right? I'm taking points over here watching us. Ah, yeah, that's it. So one of the criticisms you will hear is the word rapture is not in the Bible. And I have, I have dealt with this. I can't even explain how many times. I've dealt with it so many times, in fact, that I've actually written a little paragraph. And I've saved it on my computer so that every time it comes up, all i got to do is copy and paste. That's how many times I've dealt with this issue. <clears throat> well, so my question always first to the people is, is the word Trinity in the Bible? No. Do you believe in it? Yes. Okay. So, so what we have established, and that person usually will say, well, of course I do. So what I always did say, so we have established the fact that there's a doctrine in the Bible that can be there that doesn't have a modern day label. Is that true? Yeah. There's a lot of doctrine. What saved always saved is not in the Bible. Okay? We, we take a look at scriptures. And you know what? Honest people can look at the same scriptures and come up with different opinions when it comes to what saved always saved. I'll be honest. There are those who are Methodists who believe you can lose your salvation. And you know what? Matter of fact, I, I'm not going to say that this is one of those things I'm not going to be absolutely dogmatic on. Because there are scriptures that seem to indicate that it's possible, if I'm honest. All right. So, in a roundabout the way, in a roundabout way, though, the word rapture is in the Bible, and this is where I always lead to next, because the word rapture found in the Scripture is is, is uh, just like the word Jesus. This is transliteration. In the Hebrew, or excuse me, in the Greek New Testament, I'm not talking about your King James Version of your Bible, your ESV, or anything like that. Is the word Jesus found in the Greek? No, it's not. Jesus is the name we have given him. That is not 
his name. When he walked around Jerusalem, and when he went up into the clouds, and they said, there goes Jesus. Did they say, there goes Jesus? No, what did they say? Yeshua. Yehoshua. Jesus is not his name. It's Yeshua. Mary didn't say, oh, I'm going to name you Jesus. No, she said, I'm going to name you Yeshua. Where we get the name Jesus is from the Latin. It took the Greek. They took the Greek. Eogius. And they took it and they transliterated it into Latin. And then we have taken the same word and translated it into English. And it's Jesus. Spanish language does the same exact thing. Uh, what are some of the words, uh, the names in Spanish, male names in Spanish that, yeah, like, uh, like, yeah, John. What's John in Spanish? Juan. Juan. Okay. And there's some other ones. Peter, uh, Peter Pablo. Okay. What is it? Julius. Okay. Julian. Yeah. So there are a lot. We do this in our culture today. So just because the word rapture, R-A-P-T-U-R-E, doesn't appear, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So, in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, it's literally the Greek word harpazo, which means to be caught up. And what they have done, and that's the way it reads in, by the way, that's the way it reads in the King James Version, is caught up. And what we've done is the Latin Vulgate translates harpazo as rapiamur. And rapia more has been anglicized to say rapture. Because we're not going to walk around and go, rapia more. Okay? So we say rapture, which is a translation of the Latin, which is a translation of the Greek. So therefore, the word rapture is in the Bible, just like the word Jesus is in the Bible. All right? So we clear as mud on that. Yes, ma'am? How do you say rapture in Spanish? I don't know. How do you say caught up? What's the, what's the verb for caught up? Wow. That's amazing, isn't it? And that's because Spanish is a stem from Latin. That the Vulgate here, that is the Latin version of the Bible. Back in the early church in the 4th and 5th century, they put together what is known as the Latin Vulgate. And the Vulgate is the Latin interpretation of the Greek text. Just like what you're reading in your Bible is the English interpretation of the Greek text. The Vulgate is the Latin. So because it's the same word. And, and because Spanish and, and Latin are so close. Uh, if you know Spanish well, Latin would be a piece of cake for you. All right? So, the rapture of the church. Now, is somebody who, who has First Thessalonians 4? Liz? Me. Go ahead and read that for us. Uh, verses uh, 15, yeah, starting 15 through 18. You For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. <clears throat> For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. <coughs> then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore we comfort one another with these words. Therefore, we comfort one another with these words. Remember, first session. Why do we study Bible prophecy? To comfort one another. It's a comfort. All right, Sandy? 1 Corinthians 15? Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? And where, O oh death, is your sting? Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. That's right. Okay, so a couple of things we learned from these two passages. The righteous dead are raised first. The dead in Christ, they're raised first. They go first. So that's going to be your clue. And that will probably, if my Rosh Hashanah theory is correct, that will probably be going on during those first 99 blasts. So when things start popping up out of the ground, and you, you, you've got a little, I think we're going to have a minute or two. Yeah, 90 seconds. About 90 seconds. You know, so if you want to start stripping it off, they give you know. <laughs> Oh, my glory, right? Yeah. So here's the thing. If you're around some lost people, if you're around some lost people, you may have about 90 seconds to tell them what's about to happen. All right? But make sure that you're really hearing trumpets and you're not just off your medication. Okay? That would be that would be a bad witness. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. And don't, yeah, that's true. I'm going to start to put on my glory clothes, you know. Yes. Okay, so those alive who are changed and those alive who are caught up, mortality puts on immortality. Now, here's one of the things that, that Sandy read in 1551. This is a mystery. He said, Behold, I show you a mystery. That is the Greek word mysterion. It means a hidden thing. Okay? Now, this, is, this is very important. Every word in the Bible is important. Am I right? Yes. Right. Because, see, the resurrection of the dead was not a mystery. Job 19.26, he said, After my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. And there are numerous other Old Testament passages. The resurrection of the righteous dead is not a mystery. It was revealed in the Old Testament. Therefore, this is something new. Yes, sir. Oh, Brother Nelson, I had a pastor. Uh, he told us that uh, when he preached that uh, uh, when the dead in Christ shall be raised first, that doesn't mean they're caught up in clouds with the Lord. That means they're raised up and they stand there at attention. And they may. And then we which are alive will all be oh, caught up right. together. And that's probably that's probably true. Mm -hmm. So, you know, places to be near a rap around the time of the rapture near cemetery. That's gonna be real interesting. A lot of people think that they're gonna zoom on up and then yeah. 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 And and we don't exactly know how it's gonna happen. There's a little picture of that after Christ died on the cross some of the dead came out of the grave. That's right. Matthew 27. It would be an amazing sight to see that. Some of the ancient Jews and Hebrews. Yeah, and we don't know exactly how that all works. And it just said, it doesn't even sound like it was all of them. It sounds like it was some of them. All I know is I believe it. That's right. So, I want to do a little. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I had a, um, like a footnote online uh -huh. in reference to the First Thessalonians. It was 415, and uh -huh. it was. In First Kings thirteen seventeen, it says, "For I have been told by the word of the Lord, you shall not eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by going the way you came." I have no idea. I'd have to look it up. I know I don't know everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you just stopped them. You just stopped them. Nelson, I had another one real quick. All right. So you help me I'll look it up though. I promise. If this is wrong, write it down for me. Some people get confused on the rapture and the second coming. So I had a preacher uh, taught us in the way that like Herman said, he taught us that Jesus does not touch the earth during the rapture. I, right. Just, you're getting way ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> say that, say your footnote again, Liz. It was the footnote, it was first, uh, first Kings okay. 13 and 17. Okay, okay, I will definitely look that up. Yeah, that is actually about session three, David. So you, you gotta, you know, I gotta be patient. So here's a here's a quick review. Yeah, it was just, just, I am talking to you. I knew this was gonna happen too. I knew it. Uh, let's do a quick review. Preterist. That means a partial and full fulfillment in Revelation has already been fulfilled. Okay, that's the preterist view. The historicism is fulfilled in Christian history. Idealism is that it's all symbolic. I know. Futurism. This is where we this is where we fall in. We're we're known as futurists. 
So we have the ah mill and the post mill, and that depends on where you see the coming of Christ as, as to the thousand year reign. Post mills believe that the coming of Christ is actually after a thousand year reign of Christ on earth, or a thousand years of goodness. That's when the second coming is. Ah mills, they, they're all messed up. Uh, and then we have pre mill, which is where we stand. That means that Christ comes before the thousand year reign. And then in that, that view, we have rapture, different rapture views that we'll look at here. And this is kind of where most of us fall. So, here's a brief overview of the pre-mill position. So, this is taking out of the rapture, taking the rapture out. This is a brief summary of kind of the way premillennialists look at eschatology. You have the cross, Jesus ascends, you have an unknown length of time. You have the start of the tribulation. At the midpoint, you have the Antichrist going in to declare himself God, sitting on the throne, saying he's God, the abomination of desolation. And at the end, you have the second coming, then you have a thousand year reign of Christ, then you have the battle of Gog and Magog of Revelation 20 over here at the end, and then you have eternity. That's a brief overview, and we will actually be going through all of this. That's the reason why I'm not going to dwell here, because we're going to dwell enough here. Okay. But that's the overview, and most of you are very familiar with this. You, you know, you've heard of it. Now, taking a look at the different rapture views that we're going to look at. <clears throat> Pre-trib rapture. Let's see here. There we go. Pre-trib rapture. The rapture happens before these seven years. The pre... Oh, I should have said that. That should be pre-wrath, by the way. I copied and pasted, as you can tell. That is pre-wrath rapture. In other words, the rapture happens before the sixth seal of Revelation where we read that his wrath has come. The wrath of the Lamb has come. So, and that's also known as the mid-trib rapture. There's some varying differences within there by a couple of months. But that, that view we will look at in detail because I am not absolutely sold that that is not true. I am about 90%, 95% here and about 5 or 10% here. Okay? Uh, here is what we're going to look at today. This is what we are going to absolutely debunk. And some of it's for the reason David said, but we will look at that in session three where, you know, in the rapture of 1 Thessalonians and, and 1 Corinthians, we do not see Jesus' fit touching the Mount of Olives. Uh, whereas in the second coming, we do. But there are actually some better ways to debunk it, and we'll look at those today. And then, you know, there's the, the millennial kingdom. So, so we're going to look at the problems of the post-trib rapture. Disproving the post-trib rapture theory. That, in other words, that there is a, it's, I call it the great yo-yo. Okay, the post-trib view, and there are a lot of good people who believe in the post-trib rapture. There are a lot of very godly people who do. Okay, so do not take this that I'm sliding them. They're just wrong here. And that's fine. You know what the good deal is? They'll never know it. If we're wrong about the pre-trib rapture, we got about three and a half years to know it. Right. All right? So it ain't no harm, no foul. And it causes them to live a life of holiness, and that's great. But there's a problem. I don't believe the yo-yo, that we go up and then we come back down. All right? There's, there's several problems with that. And one I don't have on here is that there's no time for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Yeah, we're not having a supper up. Okay? We're, we're going to have a supper up there, and, and we're, but we're going to look at some of those in the later session. But, the and there's none of yeah, We're going to look at all those when we look at the pre-wrath and pre-trib rapture. So problem number one is can you do simple math? Who can do some adding? I learned in Sweeney, Texas how to add, <laughs> have, how to add one and one and it comes up two. I did learn that. Uh, so who can do simple math? If you can do simple math, Christ's return cannot be imminent, which is what we know of as the second coming of Christ as far as the taking of the bride, the church, is imminent. We have numerous verses, but here are some. Concerning that day and hour, no one knows. We talked about that, right? This cannot be true if it's post-trip, and I will show you why. Uh, therefore, you almost be ready for the sun that is coming an hour you do not expect. This cannot be true if it's post-trip, and I'll explain why. Remember what you received and heard and keep it and repent. 
If you do, will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you do not know what hour I will come against you. Cannot be true if it's post-trib. Christ's return cannot be imminent. It says, first of all, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Can't be true if it's post-trib. And I will show you why. And we'll finally, one more. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. Can't be true if it's post-trib. The day of Christ's second coming is known. We don't know it now, but there's a very interesting benchmark. Daniel 12, 11. From the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, and this is what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 24, when you see the abominations of desolations as spoken by the prophet Daniel, there shall be 1,290 days. Can you do math? Do you think if you're sitting there and the abomination of desolations happens on April 7th, 2020, that you can count 1,290 days forward? and come up to the day that Jesus is coming back? I bet you could. I bet if you're properly motivated, you can do it. <laughs> Therefore, is Christ's return then a mystery? Is it unknown? If I can say, okay, 1290 days from now is Tuesday, September 3rd, 2023. Is that an unknown day? No. Is it going to come like a thief? No, it's not. He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall take, take the change the times of the law and they shall be given his hand for a time, times and a half a time. That is 42 months. That is 1260 days. Okay, there's a 30 day gap somewhere between here and this is what we'll talk about later. But here are the other verses. These are the verses that mention basically three and a half years. A time is, three, is a year. Okay, when you see a time, that's a year. A times, that's a doubling of the year, and a half a time, that's six months. So three and a half years. So the scriptures that say three and a half years are right there. The scriptures that say 1260 days, they're right there. And the scriptures that say 42 months are right there. So God's got it covered whether you're looking at years, months, or days. He tells you that day, it will be on that day, and you use this as your benchmark. So therefore, if you can do simple math, you will know the day of the Lord's second coming, and it will not be a mystery. He cannot come like a thief. So therefore, when it says he's coming like a thief, it must be talking about something different than the second coming. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the post-trib rapture people lump the rapture in with the second coming. It's basically the same event in two parts. The rapture happens in the second coming. It's a boom, boom. It's the same day of the Lord event. Can't be because of this. And this is the number one issue. Now, the second one that I've rarely seen is you've got a population problem. Did everybody know that flesh and blood, humans, inhabit the millennial kingdom? Am I right? Mm -hmm. There will be physical people with flesh and blood who will live and die in the thousand-year reign of Christ. We know that from a lot of verses, but one of them is Isaiah 65, 20. There shall no be a, more an infant who lives only but a few days. It won't happen. An old man who does not fill out his days, for the young man will die at 100. See, there's a difference here. But people, guess what, are still dying. And a sinner 100 years old shall be accursed. People are still dying in this period, and we know for a fact that this is the millennial reign of Christ. It's got flesh and blood people in it. Well, the rapture causes our mortal bodies to be put on to put on immortality. It's we establish that, right? Separate, second coming, what happens? Separate the sheep from the goats, right? If all the saints are in immortal bodies and all the lost are condemned and separated, who's left to populate the earth? How are you going to get people who are infants, who, who, who no longer, who will live longer than 100 days, and a young man who dies at 100? How is this going to happen if all the, the righteous people have immortal bodies and all the unrighteous are in hell? Who does this? It can't be. Okay? So you've got a population problem. Who's going to fill the earth? And this is just one of the scriptures where we know that. Look, and one of the scriptures we read in Zechariah 14. 
if you do not go up and worship the Feast of Tabernacles and Jesus' birthday, you're accursed. How are it righteous, immortal people going to be cursed? You're, you're glorified. You're not going to sin. But yet there seems to be people who will sin. And we also see at the end of Revelation where Gog and Magog once again rise up and people come and fight the Lord. you got a population problem. Next thing you have is a Noah and Lot problem. In the days of Noah, you've heard that phrase, for in the days of Noah so will be the coming of the Son of Man. They were, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware that the flood came and swept them away. Okay? Likewise, uh, with Lot. In the days of Lot, we see this in Luke 17. They were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day Lot went out from Sodom fire and sulfur rained down. Now, if you've done your homework, you all have read the book of Revelation. If you did what you're supposed to do, right? And you remember all of those seal judgments, trumpet judgments, and vile judgments. Does that sound like life as usual to you? It doesn't sound like life is usual to me. It doesn't sound like people are just partying and having a good time and marrying and we're just planting and sowing and living life as normal because that ain't normal. When a third of the population gets killed and, and, and famines break out and locusts are swarming the world who are demonic locusts, and we'll talk about that and how, well, how we know that they're demons and not locusts, that is not normal. So this can't be what Jesus is talking about. Okay? Because there ain't going to be a whole lot of people at the second coming of Christ. Because it's going to be so bad, Jesus said, if it were not for the elect, and if it, but for the elect's sake, those what are cut short? The days. And we'll talk about what that really means. Okay? Because remember, we got a fixed day, number of days. We can't cut the number short, so it has to be something else, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but... Because it's so bad, Jesus said, if I didn't come back, everybody's going to die. So it doesn't sound like they were just living carefree, fancy lives. Right. So you've got a Noah and Lot problem. And, it's, and it doesn't sound like what's going on in the Great Tribulation. You've got a Jewish problem. Seventy weeks are decreed for your people. In other words, God is saying, I've got 70 weeks, which is 490 years. It's 77s. Mm -hmm. 490 years decreed for your people to do something. And it's called put an end to, uh, put a, uh, finish the transgression, put an end to sin, atone for iniquity, and bring in everlasting righteousness. That is the Jews who get to do that. We have 69 weeks already fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled that 69th week when he walked into <clears throat> Jerusalem and said, I am your king. There's one week left. There's a period of seven years left. If the church is here, remember what Paul said in Romans 11. For, you know, Jerusalem will be chomping down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. And the fullness of the Gentiles in Romans 10 and 11. When we get the fullness of the Gentiles come in, then it's Jews' turn again. We, get that, we hear that in the scripture. Mm -hmm. If the church is here throughout that entire time, there is no reason to seal 144,000 evangelists. Right. Okay? So you've got a Jewish problem. I heard that uh, Don Kippur was supposed to be the 6,000 year. It is the 6,000th year, we think. Okay, number, number five. You have a restrainer problem. 2 Thessalonians 2. For the mystery of lawlessness is it already at work. There's one person who restrains it and will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will kill with the breath of his, lot, of his mouth and bring to nothing the appearance of his coming. Who is this, who is this man of lawlessness? No, 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 not the restraint. Who is, who is the lawless one? Antichrist. So you have, and we believe, now this is a less, little shakier because some of the post-tribbers will say that the restrainer is the archangel Michael or something like that. But we believe the restrainer is the, the church. And there's some reasons why we'll talk about this. But we believe it's the Holy Spirit dwelling within the church. And if the Holy Spirit is the restrainer, 
And the dwelling in the church is what this is talking about. The Antichrist cannot be revealed until it's gone. And so basically, the Antichrist would only be able to reveal for about a minute if it's post-trib. And that just doesn't fit because we know the Antichrist is revealed two separate times. He's revealed when he makes a signs of covenant. But you know what? Bill Clinton and Yasser Arafat and uh, was it Ariel Sharon mm -hmm. uh, who signed the covenant, the Oslo Accords, mm -hmm. back in September of 1993. Mm -hmm. And guess what? It was a seven-year deal. Mm -hmm. And that, that caused some prophecy people to go, Whoa. okay? But we know for sure that he is revealed when he walks into the temple and says, I'm God. So, if the restrainer is still here, then we won't know that. And, and so it just doesn't, it doesn't line up. The Antichrist cannot be revealed until the restrainer is removed. And the when the restrainer is removed, that's when there will be hell. That's right. And that's the sixth seal. Uh, all the, the first five seals take place probably over the first three and a half years, but I'm not real dogmatic about that either. But that sixth seal is probably when the Antichrist goes into the temple. I didn't hear you talking about that other dude when I said, you know, Holy Spirit. We know what you meant, Herman. Oh, Ain't nobody thinking that you think the Holy Spirit's the Antichrist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so any questions besides what 1 Kings 14, 17 means? Or whatever it was. I will look it up. You know I will. Go ahead. Do you have, do you have something, baby? No, no. Okay. So those are, the, those are the main reasons why we believe that the post-trib rapture view has to be false. And the, the chief among them is you, you have a population problem. Who's going to pop? Who's, the, who's left? Okay. I mean, we see the separation of the sheep and the goats. And then you have a math problem because anybody who can count, what's that? Look at it. Real quick. In 1994, that's when it was. Mm -hmm. It's Sakura Bean, that's who it was. Shimon Perez and Yasser Arafat received the Nobel Prize. That was in 94 when they received it, but the Oslo Accords were in 93. That's when that young fellow shot. Uh, yes, that's right. That's, when he shot. that's why he shot him. Hey. And they would believe me, when he got killed, because of that, and it was almost three and a half years after, I was look for about three days there, I was, oh, man. <laughs> yes, and for about three and a half days there, I remember I was in California in Long Beach at a conference when it happened. And I remember for about three and a half days, I was looking at the news constantly to make sure that he didn't get up from the dead. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, and well, because of the hedge, the, the moral head wound that was healed, and he had signed that, and so that was a big thing in prophecy circles. Mm -hmm. So those are your two main reasons that you can, when you run into people who are always well, post trib, you can say you got a math problem, you got a population problem, All right? So if you can do simple math, and you know. And it's going to be on the news when the Antichrist makes himself God. Trust me. They just need to go back and read. That's right. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's go have some worship. Father, we just want to thank you for this time that we can spend together as a family. And Lord, learn about your word. And as we go deeper into this uh, blessed hope, and Father, I pray that it will bring comfort to us. Lord, it's meant to bring comfort to us. Uh, that's the reason why you gave it to us, Father, so that we can comfort one another. So Father, that we know that we will be reunited with those who have gone before us, Father. And that we won't just be reunited in kind of a spiritual way, but Father, bodily, we will be reunited. This flesh will put on immortality. And Father, there will be no more sickness. There will be no more death. There will be no more illness, Father. Father, uh, we will have glorified bodies like your son has a glorified body. For Father, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And for that, we give you thanks. Because only you can do that. No other God promises such a blessed hope. And that's why you are the God of gods. You are the, you are the God of all the universe, the creator. And we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Y'all have a blessed week.